On today's show, we have a Locked on Rockets listener mailbag handling questions and topics such as, has Eric Gordon become untradeable? What happens if the Rockets decide to just hold on to Eric Gordon as a long-term piece of their rebuild, given what he provides as a veteran presence on the floor? Where do the Rockets project defensively next season with the additions of Jabari Smith Jr. and Tari Eason? Who has the most to prove next season? Who's poised for a sneaky good season this upcoming year? Will Jalen Green average more than 22 and a half points per game? All of those topics and more coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You get somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Com. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. We are free and available on every single podcast platform. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, all of them. You name it, we're there on podcasts. We're also on YouTube. Go check us out on YouTube. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, for today's show, we are going to dive into a Locked on Rockets listener mailbag with a variety of different topics. We've got couple eg questions we've got you know where do the rockets project defensively next season uh jalen green scoring average who is poised to have a sneaky good season this upcoming year who has the most to prove this upcoming season we're going to tackle all of that and we're not going to waste any time getting directly into it so let's go ahead and dive into our very first question here from mike uh under the radar position battles going into camp now the number one position battle at the forefront of everybody's mind is Dacian Nix versus Ty Ty Washington in that backup point guard spot. And I do believe that Mike kind of clarified that when asking this question, but I only have so many characters to do the cool little production value stuff on the screen. So I had to limit some of that. But uh, yeah, that's the number one position battle, right? I think the under the radar position battle, uh, two of them actually are going to be Usman Garuba and Bruno Fernando, actually, surprisingly, uh, just because we we still really haven't gotten a chance to really see Usman Garuba play high level basketball for the Houston Rockets. And I think that the Rockets turning around and extending that basically a training camp offer to Bruno Fernando an offer that could be uh, turned into a two way deal. He's kind of them hedging a little bit. On, on on Usman, I should say, right? Because if Uzi can't stay healthy, can't figure it out, if he doesn't work out right, then, you know, Bruno showed some flashes last season. He doesn't nearly have the, the potential, the sky-high ceiling that Usman Garuba does as a defensive presence at the NBA level, all of that. But that would be an under-the-radar battle that I'd be absolutely keeping my eye on. And then it's weird because I can't make this as like a one-for-one -one battle, but... KJ Martin and like the million forwards on the Rockets roster, right? Like, you know, they've got Tari Eason, Jay Sean Tate, Eric Gordon. If he's starting at the three spot is going to absorb a ton of those minutes. So there's a big battle for wing minutes specifically. So maybe it's less of a positional battle and more just a battle for minutes out of the gate. And I am curious to see where Steven Silas ultimately goes, who he awards those minutes to. And so that's just kind of an all out. It's less of a one for one battle uh, or a position battle and more of an all out freaking brawl for who's going to get those those backup wing minutes. I think we can safely assume that Eric Gordon and Jay Shantae are getting chunks of them and then past that. You know, you've got Tari, you've got KJ, you've got Garrison, who's going to effectively have to play some wing minutes if he wants to be in the rotation. There's a lot going on there. Let's get to our next question here. Uh, lineup prediction after trade deadline this coming season and what players need to do or will do to achieve that lineup. This is going to be, and this is from uh, our guy Tiziano. Shout out to my guy Tiziano. Huge fan of the show. Um, this one is a little bit harder to predict this early and I'm inclined to say that the Rockets 
are, are kind of in a position where they don't necessarily like, I think this is more so dependent on if the front office ultimately makes any moves regarding Eric Gordon, right? Because the Rockets starting lineup, I, I don't think 80% of it is going to change at all, right? That's KPJ, Jalen, Jabari, and Al P. Those four are going to be there. The fifth one, who we still don't even know who's going to be the fifth starter, whoever Silas throws in at the, as the fifth starter is likely going to be the fifth starter the entirety of the season unless that fifth starter is Eric Gordon and they decide to move him in a deal before the trade deadline. And then at that point, it's kind of anyone's game as to who could be the new fifth starter, right? Or if he decides to start Jay Sean Tate to start the season, right? Game one of 82. Jay Sean Tate's probably still going to be the starter post All-Star break. Like I wouldn't expect a gigantic shakeup to happen for this Rockets team around the All-Star break. I wouldn't expect some trades to happen. And I genuinely wouldn't expect somebody like Tari Eason to have such a phenomenal season that he just injects himself and forces Steven Silas, gives Silas no choice but to throw him into the starting lineup. I just don't think we have seen enough out of how Steven Silas handles young players and rookies to feel like that's the direction that this team would go. I think that some of the rookies on this year's team are going to be brought along rather slowly, kind of like the rookies last season were. And because of that, I don't think we're going to see like a crazy, like mid season lineup change where somebody is, you know, thrown it, uh, you know, and maybe Silas completely proves me wrong, right? Maybe he looks back on the last two years of how he's handled lineups and adjustments and things like that. And, and decides that he needs to be uh, a little bit more short with the leash about, you know, subbing guys in and out and playing with the starting lineup and, you know, testing different things out effectively. So that could be, you know, th that's a little bit harder to predict this completely far out. Now, our next question we've got from Bobby Rockets 29. Shout out, Bobby. How do you feel about keeping EG on the team long term? I think at this point, we're almost at a place, right? And this is the interesting argument with Eric Gordon. We're almost at a place where the Rockets, you know, after this next season, effectively, they're going to want to be competitive again because that's when the picks owed to OKC start becoming an issue again. This is the last year that the Rockets have full control over their destiny of their picks. And so it's OK if the Rockets bottom out again this season or if they're a bad team again this season because, you know, they could get a top pick, right? Women, Diana, Scoot, Scoot Henderson, whoever. With Eric Gordon, though, he's a valuable player, and he's on a relatively team-friendly deal for the production that he provides. The Rockets have him effectively under contract for two more years, although this next season you know, is operating almost as if it's an expiring deal because the final year of his contract, not guaranteed. Keeping Eric Gordon for the long term wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. However, I'm of the opinion now, especially with the additions that the Rockets have made to their roster, I'd rather them give up that chunk of minutes that Eric Gordon is going to consume every single night, anywhere from 25 to 30 minutes a night, whatever. I'd rather see them give those minutes to guys like KJ, like Tari, like Jay Sean, right? Legitimate wings, like NBA size wings, not a guard who's playing up a position just because he can, because he's got a stockier build and he's a veteran. So he knows how to defend that position a little bit better. I'd rather see them, give those minutes to those other players moving forward to really kind of gather more data on what the Rockets have with those guys before deciding like, oh, well, KJ is going to get squeezed from the rotation because EG has got to start and then they've got to give minutes to Tate and then minutes to Tari. Like, I don't want to see young guys with a lot of potential with sky high potential like KJ Martin getting squeezed from the Rockets rotation in favor of a, in favor of a veteran like Eric Gordon. We saw some young guys like KJ being squeezed for minutes last season in favor of guys like Daniel House Jr. and David Nwaba and stuff like that. And it was kind of odd. So I'd rather not that not be the case. And even though the Rockets are hopefully going to be back towards being somewhat competitive or at least on the uptrend next season, I don't think that they need Eric Gordon around for that to happen. And I think it would be better if it happens with younger guys who have a more long-term fit and role within this organization. 
Coming up, we're going to dive into more listener questions. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Bet Online because betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your sports betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. You can find reviews and news of every single league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. They've got you covered for everything over at Bet Online. Right now, you can take a look at who the favorites are for the 2023. NBA title leading the way the Boston Celtics at plus 400 you got the Milwaukee Bucks at plus 550 the Golden State Warriors not the favorites to repeat sitting in third place at plus 700 you got the LA Clippers John Wall's new home at plus 750 and then rounding out the top five the Phoenix Suns at plus 1000 where are the Rockets on this list hang on Rockets are dead last at how many zeros is this one two is that plus a hundred thousand all right, go throw some money on the Rockets to win the title. Go throw like $10 on the Rockets to win the title, and you'll get uh, an insane return on that. But yeah, for all of those odds and more, be sure to check out Bet Online. Go visit their website. Uh, use your mobile, de- mobile device to learn more about the trends and action available to you. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's go ahead and continue on with our listener mailbag here. And our very next question comes from Doobie the Chef on Twitter. Where do you think we could project defensively ranked in the league next season as a team? You know, it's crazy because immediately after the the draft and everything, I was very much a proponent of the idea that the Rockets have almost shifted their defensive identity seemingly overnight, right? With the additions that they got, the players they got, Jabari, Tari, they're going to be a bigger team. You're starting Alper and Shingun instead of Christian Wood. Uh, you know, they're still bringing back defensive key pieces like Jay Sean Tate more, you know, at this point, pretty likely Eric Gordon, it seems like. Um, you know, other other young guys taking strides defensively, KPJ, Jalen Green, adding Lionel Hollins is going to be huge for this Rockets defense. That said, this is still going to be a young team, right? And they're still going to make young player mistakes. They're still going to have to learn how to play together. They're still going to have to learn how to get accustomed to NBA schemes. I think that Jabari by himself is going to cover a lot of ground defensively and make up for a lot of mistakes that the Rockets make defensively. And I think that just that's the impact that we saw him have in summer league, right? Where we saw Jabari just cleaning up left and right and basically being like this one man wrecking crew defensively. I think we're going to see a lot of that in play with the Rockets starting lineup this next season. I am hopeful that the Rockets aren't going to be dead last in defense. I tentatively want to say that they will be somewhere in, 20 to 25, like in that range uh, for the majority of the season. And I'm hoping that they finish the season somewhere 15 through 20. I think for a team as young as the Rockets, that is an absolutely attainable goal. And that is a respectable goal if you achieve it to say, hey, we went from being dead last in defense this past season to less than a year from that to being a middle of the pack team defensively. And then you keep that trend going into the following season where you build on that foundation, you build on those principles and you hopefully, you know, launch that team from being, you know, middle of the pack 15 to 20 defensively into that upper echelon of 10 to 15 or even a top 10 defense, right? If you're thinking the Rockets are going to be a top 10 defense out the gate to start the season, I would just like implore you to pump the brakes on that really quick. Cause again, they're going to be a young team. So they're going to make a ton of rookie mistakes. A lot of that's still going to happen. We're going to see a lot of the same frustrations we had last season. Again, this year, the difference is there are some pieces individually like Jabari, like Tari, adding those guys, adding the size to the roster, all of that. Those individual pieces are going to help situationally. And so it might not look as bad at all times. And there's going to be moments where it looks really, really good. But I think the averages are still going to be less than desirable to start the season at least. Let's go to our next question here from Sean. So any likelihood the Rockets have Josh Christopher bring the ball up in a Shingun centered bench unit? You know, I think that Josh, you know, Jacob is capable of bringing the ball up, right? He's not a traditional point guard by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that said, like, 
you know, anybody can really bring the ball up in the Rockets offense. And if Shingoon is out there, if he's running some, you know, Shingoon centered bench unit minutes and Josh is out there, I don't think there's a reason why, you know, Josh couldn't be the guy bringing the ball up or running a bit more of the the on-ball action uh, with Shingoon kind of still being that primary playmaker. That said, I don't know how often or I don't even know what we're going to see Steven Silas do as far as staggering his starters with the bench unit. And a big part of how that plays out is who ultimately winds up being the starter in that fifth spot if it's Eric Gordon or Jay Sean Tate. Because if you bring Jay Sean Tate off the bench, he's a guy that you can kind of, you know, run the offense through a little bit, right? He can take on some of the the second unit ball handling and playmaking responsibilities, if you will. Whereas if you start Jay Sean Tate, then maybe the Rockets ultimately decide to stagger or not stagger, I should say, Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. If they keep those two guys together for a majority of their minutes, maybe they do something like they sub out Alper and Shingun early in the game at like the five or six minute mark. And then they bring him back with, you know, two, you know, a couple minutes into the second quarter. And then he's kind of running the show in that second unit defensively or a second unit offensively, I should say, from an offensive perspective, when Jalen Green and KPJ are getting their rest. Maybe Steven Silas decides he wants to go and stagger KPJ and Jalen Green like we saw him do for stints of last season, effectively giving each of those guys a chance to run the offense on their own without the other on the floor. A lot of those questions are going to be answered as soon as we get to training camp, because we're going to get a better idea I shouldn't say training camp, I apologize, uh, preseason, because as soon as we get to preseason and we see the first game or two, we'll have a very solid idea of what Steven Silas's preliminary rotation is going to look like, because it's one thing to hammer down, all right, these are going to be your starters. It's a completely another, ba- it's a completely different battle to try and scope out, all right, these are the guys who are going to be subbed out at this point, These, this is going to be the bench unit, this is how the starters are going to stagger with these other guys. We have an idea of what some of the lineups are going to look like. But as it stands right now, um, yeah, I don't see why Josh Christopher couldn't be, you know, effectively the primary ball handler in a Shingoon led bench unit, uh, at least maybe for stretches of the game. Right. Because there's definitely going to be points out there where those two guys are probably sharing the floor and it would help right to have Josh bring the ball up, get Shingoon set up offensively, that kind of thing. Let's go to our next question here in this segment from Jalen. Who do you think out of the Rockets is going to have a sneaky good year this season? I think that Jay Sean Tate is poised for a legitimately good year. Um, And I also think like, and this is weird because he's going to factor in a couple more of these questions that we've got coming up. Also, Kevin Porter Jr. Like KPJ is poised for an absolute breakout season. And so, and like less so Jay Sean Tate, right? Like Jay Sean Tate's not going to like, you know, put up all-star numbers or something this year. But I think that the, you know, the fact that JT's going into his third year, uh, he just re-upped a new contract. He's comfortable in his role with this team. He's established a lot of the trust with the coaching staff. He's being widely regarded as one of the veterans on this Rockets roster. I think that Jay Sean Tate could be headed for a very solid year this season, especially because I'm hoping he isn't played out of position this year. I'm hoping that Silas and company use him as a legitimate three, not an undersized four, at least not, you know, not full time like he did last season, because I do think that that's a disservice to JT, right? That's a disservice to Jay Sean Tate playing him at the four spot. You're playing against bigger, stronger dudes. You know, even though Jay Sean Tate can do it situationally, I don't think he should have to do it for an entire 48 minute game play him at his natural position on the wing and watch him flourish, being able to lock down actual wing players defensively rather than going toe to toe with six, eight, six, 10, sometimes seven footers down low, that kind of thing. So I do think it's Jay Sean Tate. And I do think KPJ right after everything that we saw last year out of him, I think that he's in a prime position to have an explosive year to really look insanely, insanely good. And so maybe it's not sneaky for KPJ. Maybe that's more so the explosive, you know, the expectation for KPJ, but he's the the other name that I would kind of throw into the hat for, for the Rockets as far as, you know, a, a sneaky good year this season. Coming up, we're going to dive into the rest of our Rockets mailbag questions. We're going to get there in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, we are free and available on every single podcast platform, including YouTube. Go check us out on YouTube. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Let's go ahead and continue on with our Rockets mailbag questions. Let's get this next one here. 
Do you see KPJ as a main piece for this team moving forward? I would prefer a playmaking defender at point guard. As it stands right now, yes. Like, uh, you know, I don't... The way KPJ and his future is, is going to be regarded by the Rockets, right, is dependent on how this next season looks, right? There's no more Christian Wood. There's no more of that uncertainty. There's no more of the cloud of, okay, it's his first year at point guard. How's he going to look? All this. The expectations are probably very clearly being set by the, the Rockets organization as to what they're expecting to see out of Kevin Porter Jr. this next season. And even as fans, right? Like there are some very clear expectations out of KPJ this next year. If he regresses, if he has, you know, another rough half start to the season and then he kills it in the second half of the season, that's going to be a red flag, right? If he can't be consistent from the start of the season all the way to th through the end of the season, right? If he has moments and lapses where he's not getting others involved offensively, right? Those need to be minimized, right? If you're the point guard on the floor. I think that right now, yes, KPJ is a main piece for this Rockets team. You could make the argument that, and I think it's a very legitimate argument to be made. You could make the argument that KPJ's ceiling is higher than Jalen Green's ceiling. That's how talented he is, and that's why the Rockets are so heavily invested in seeing what he can truly be. Because if KPJ hits the ceiling, that is a future perennial all-star type player. A dynamic shot creator and shot maker who can play at a high level, who's been able to defend at a high level, I mean, who's shown progress defensively at a high level, who can shoot the ball insanely well, who can play on or off the ball, all these variables for KPJ. So I understand the desire, right, to have like a, I don't know, like a Patrick Beverly type next to, you know, Jalen Green or a Marcus Smart type, right? Defense first and, you know, we'll hit shots and we'll be hard-nosed and gritty and all that. I don't think that Jalen Green has shown to be that type of playmaker or offensive engine yet to where you feel comfortable in not having another subsequent primary ball handler next to him. And there's very few point guards that kind of fit that mold anymore in today's NBA. A lot of point guards are very much like dynamic scorers, creators, um, guys who are going to be able to score the basketball at a very elite level. Those traditional like floor general point guards are few and far between in today's NBA. Uh, you know, the and again, when you look at like the Marcus Smart types, the Patrick Beverly types, um, I don't know, the Malcolm Brogdon types, like there's just not a ton of those guys out there, and there's not a ton of those guys at you know that are young that are out there, right? Like, I guess Jalen Suggs is like the first guy that comes to mind, is like that type, that kind of guy that fits that more so floor general role, traditional point guard scheme, whatever. And if you're looking for that, the Rockets have two guys that kind of fit that mold in Dacian Nix and Ty Ty Washington, right? Those two guys are definitely more traditional point guards than Kevin Porter Jr. is. So if things don't work out with KPJ, the Rockets have two guys waiting the wings who have shown and flashed a lot of talent and who may be able to be like that replacement piece moving forward within the Rockets lineup within the Rockets rotation. I think this is a really interesting question here from Billy B. Uh, has Eric Gordon become untradeable. <sighs> I definitely don't think he's become untradeable, but I do think that the market is just not in a good spot right now and hasn't been for a while for the Rockets to try and capitalize on an Eric Gordon trade. Ultimately, if the Rockets were able to get a future first round draft pick for Eric Gordon from a team that, you know, makes sense, right? Rather than like this past season, right? Ever the only only teams we're offering were 2022 first round draft picks. Probably the, coming up this next season, they're probably only offering 2023 first round draft picks. And you got to weigh, right, what the positives of what Eric Gordon provides still being a member of this team and being on the floor and you know, the veteran presence and his actual play, right? The fact that he's arguably still the best player on the Rockets team. Again, I, I'm not trying to ruffle feathers by saying that. It's like, again, Jalen, KPJ, Shingoon, sky high potential, right? Eric Gordon's still the best player on this Rockets team. The most polished, best defender, all of that. So all that to say that I think the Rockets just haven't been in a position to capitalize on a trade for him. So it's it's less so that Eric Gordon is untradeable and more that the market is not in a great spot for EG to be dealt. And the teams that EG would 
would fit on best are also being stingy and reluctant with their draft picks, right? We saw Phoenix being reluctant to deal a pick this past season. The Lakers are in a position where they would desperately, you know, could, could use, you know, Eric Gordon and his services. He'd be a primo fit for what they're trying to do. They've only got their 2027 first and their 2029 first round draft pick to play with. So they're not trying to move either of those unless they're getting back like a star caliber player, right? Like a Westbrook for Kyrie Irving type swap. So the teams out there that make sense as potential Eric Gordon landing spots are currently, you know, indisposed of, or at least, you know, they're just playing hardball. And last thing to consider is the Kevin Durant domino, right? Kevin Durant has like completely put a stoppage to all other trades and moves and whatever, because Every team is waiting with bated breath, trying to see what KD is going to do, what direction he's going to go, where he's going to get dealt. And I feel like that is currently the uh, the dam that is holding up any other subsequent moves during this offseason period. And as soon as the KD trade happens, if it happens during the offseason, we'll see a, a, a subsequent few like trickle-down trades happen right after that where teams are like, okay, we missed out on the KD sweepstakes. Who else is still on the market that we can get to improve our team right now? And Eric Gordon is easily one of the names at the top of that list for a team that wants to be viable in the playoffs and wants to compete for a chip right now this next season. Let's go to our next question from Keldon R., what happens if Javari's and if Jabari's never a star and more of a high end role player? I don't know. Nothing like it. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, I think the idea that if Jabari's like, you know, absolute ceiling is like a super duper high end role player. That's not the end of the world, because at the end of the day, well, I do think he has star potential and I do think we're going to see that translate over time, I, you know, High-end role players are hard to come by, right? Guys who can, again, if if all Jabari does for the rest of his career is hit threes at a close to 40% clip, be big and tall, rebound the ball well, and play defense the way we saw him play defense in Summer League, I already think the floor for Jabari is higher than I had it before. Like, after his Summer League performance... I have Jabari's floor now at at least like an all-star borderline type talent who is going to be an all NBA defender one day. And so with that, like increasing his floor, I don't even think his floor is anymore. Like it's, it's not a high end role player anymore. His floor is a low end all-star who is able to impact the game defensively more than he does offensively, right? If he never adds anything else to his offensive bag, then He's effectively, you know, a, a, a lengthy guy who can attack off the catch a little bit, spot up three point shooter, um, you know, elite, you know, hyper elite, hyper elite shooting big man who can play the three, the four, the five, who can defend multiple positions. That's still an all star caliber player. So at this point, I, I don't even want to entertain the question, honestly, because I don't think Jabari is going to just be a high end role player. I think he's already flashed enough talent to be comfortable in expecting him to be more than that mainly because of the defense, right? If we were just looking at him offensively, then yeah, I'd say he needs to add quite a bit more to his game to break into that all-star tier of player and not just high-end role player. But because we've seen him be so effective defensively already and the impact that he's going to have defensively at the NBA level, I think he's going to be more on that low-end spectrum of all-star at a bare minimum across his NBA career. Let's go to our next question from CTM2187. A nice kind of a bot sounding name, but I'm assuming it's initials. So uh, thank you, CTM, for your question. Who has the most to prove on the Rockets? Who's in trouble if the player doesn't have a good season? Uh, most to prove is KPJ. Like, sorry, that's uh, that's easy, easy, easy pickings here. Low hanging fruit, maybe for this question. Uh, who's in trouble if the player doesn't have a good season? KPJ? <laughs> like, I think that this year is going to be big, right? This year is the two biggest years for players, for people on this Rockets team, it's Kevin Porter Jr. and Steven Silas. This is like the the make it or the make or break year for both of those guys, right? Steven Silas has to show that he can be the guy moving forward for this Rockets organization. That he's not just the developmental coach or the coach to have, you know, at the beginning stages of the rebuild. He has to show that he's the guy long term. And so we need to see enough out of him to feel confident in saying, we want Steven Silas here long term. Not only that, KPJ, right? If KPJ has a stellar year, he's going to get a payday. He's going to get a big contract, and he's going to be the guard of the future for the Houston Rockets. If he has a bad year, I mean, the you know, he cost himself a payday. The Rockets are probably still going to hold on to him, but they might start, 
you know, exploring other options, right? Considering, you know, moving him to a reserve role, you know, maybe he's better served as a six man off the bench. Like there's a lot of different ways that the KPJ thing could ultimately play out. I'm still in the, like, I want to see KPJ be so, like, I want to see him be the point guard of the future. I think that he has all the tools to do it. I think the ceiling is incredibly high. I think that when you combine KPJ, Jalen Green, and Alper and Shingun together offensively, I think that has the chance to be one of the most potent trios offensively in the NBA. And then you also add Jabari Smith Jr. into that core. The sky is the limit for this Rockets team. But yes, it, it has to be KPJ, and Steven Silas, by extension. I think you were just asking about players, CTM, but yes, KPJ and Steven Silas have the most to prove on the Rockets this season. We're going to hit a couple more questions here to round things out. Will Jalen Green average over 22.5 PPG this season? I'm going to say no. I think he's going to be like in between 20 to 22 is kind of where I ballparked it. So 22.5 would be just outside of that. I think Jalen falls between 20 to 22. Uh, shout out to Yup Blaze for that question. And then uh, last legitimate question here, and then I'll get to a couple fun ones. Uh, what happens to David Nwaba from Freddie B? Look, David Nwaba is just sitting on the end of the Rockets bench. He's salary filler if the Rockets orchestrate a trade that requires throwing in a body uncle Dave is getting thrown into that into that trade right David Nwaba is not part of the rotation he you know flashed some potential at times you know way back when the Rockets thought that you know they could use a, a serviceable defensive wing you know he's basically the guy that's sitting at the end of the bench and you throw him in if you know there's injuries or if you've got guys resting or sitting out um David Nwab is an incredible person, right? He's super, you know, super down to earth, really cool guy, great to ask questions to, but he doesn't have a spot effectively moving forward in this Rockets roster. There's so many wings ahead of him. Um, he's going to be, I, he's just either going to, you know, expire or the Rockets are going to throw him in as like contract filler, or maybe there's a team desperate enough out there that they throw like a second rounder to Houston if they like just need like a body, a serviceable wing body at some point this next season. So, those are the end of the legitimate serious questions. Although we did have two more fun questions here and I'll just do partially on one of these because I, I wasn't able to put, I, I can't, you know, go one for one here, but one of the questions from average goblin was which parks and rec character would each person on our starting lineup be and why? Um, I wouldn't, I wasn't able to do like, I couldn't come up with one for one, like, you know, comps for each of the starting lineup, but if we pretend that Eric Gordon is going to be one of the starters, I think you have to say that EG is Ron Swanson uh, because EG has those moments, right? Where he's super animated and he's, you know, like laughing, having a good time. But he also has those moments like in the pressers where he's just very serious down to earth, like doing his job, you know, babysitting all the kids, like all that. I think that fits kind of Ron Swanson to a T. So I'm going to say Eric Gordon is Ron Swanson. I'm also going to think about this a little bit further and see if I can figure out any more connections that don't necessarily have to do with just the starting lineup, but just other players on the roster as they relate to potential parks and rec characters. Cause I love that question. And then our final question was from longtime listener of the show stormy who asked uh, if I would grow out a mullet to take a side-by-side -side pick with none other than Gary bird, Gary, the mullet bird himself. Uh, if I could guarantee that I could get next to Gary bird and he would willingly take a side-by-side -side mullet picture. I absolutely would grow out the mullet. Um, we'll do locked on mullets here at some point this season. If I can guarantee that, uh, if Gary bird actually does grow out the mullet, then maybe I'll have to, uh, say, Hey man, you know, people want me to grow out a mullet to match you. Like we, we take a picture when it happens and we'll see how that plays out, but that's going to do it for today's episode. As always, appreciate you for tuning into the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. We're also on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.